Judges chapter 6, verses 11 through 15. And we're going to talk specifically, uh, you'll have to wait for a little while, but at the end we're going to talk about shock troops. Can you say that with me? Shock troops. So let's read this. Let's read this. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizrite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Say, mighty man of valor. <coughs> Say, mighty woman of valor. Mighty woman of valor. Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all of his miracles which our father told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So he said to him, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest, somebody say weakest, weakest. in Manasseh, and I am the least, say least, least, in my father's house. Aren't you glad it doesn't matter what you think of yourself, or even what others think of you? It's what God says of you that matters. It's what God says you are that defines who you really are. Amen? morning as we look at this, here is Gideon, and Israel is surrounded by the Midianites. How many in your life have ever felt surrounded by what the enemy is trying to do? Yeah. Yeah. Feels like the enemy is camping around you, and you have no way in or no way out. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. And, and the enemy has surrounded Israel. And you look at this situation, and we know that the Bible tells us before this that Israel cried out to God. Now that's powerful. And you might not catch it as you read it, but I want you to understand that God still hears the cry of His people. Yes. That God still hears when you feel surrounded, and it doesn't matter what the enemy has done. If you just lift up a voice and cry out to God, then you can know for sure that God has heard your voice. And that God will come and that He'll restore things. And, and many times when God begins to move, He doesn't do it like we think He ought to. Come on. You know what I'm talking about. How many ever just thought, God, what are you up to? What are you doing? God, how did you choose this person? Or how did you choose that person? That's right. And we see Gideon. And he is threshing wheat. Now there's something wrong with the picture. Yes. Because he's threshing wheat when he should be worried about fighting the enemy. Come on, sometimes we get distracted. Yes. Amen? Yes. And he should have been fighting the enemy. And he's, instead, he's threshing wheat. And he's going to hide it. You, you can tell that your motive is wrong when fear is the motive. Oh, right. And, and so we see him threshing wheat, going through the process, a cowardly and fearful act. But look what happens. God sends the angel of the Lord to speak to him. Now first of all, I want you to, to tell you that there's a thing called divine prerogative. That means no matter how messed up you are, <laughs> come on, anybody else in here messed up a little bit? <laughs> it doesn't matter where you are or even if you are doing what you ought to be doing at the moment, that God has the prerogative to show up in your situation and to show out, and it is a divine prerogative to bless you 
and to make a difference in your life, even if you're all messed up. Now, that ought to bless you today. Let me just say it this way. If you were only blessed when you had it all right, when everything was together, how many times would you have been blessed? And so we look at Gideon and we shame, shame on Gideon. But I'm so glad for the divine prerogative of God to show up even when I'm messed up. Come on, that's good preaching. Yeah. 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 To show up and to show up is his the divine prerogative to show up his right to bless you. The angel comes to Gideon and he says, Hey! I believe you had to yell, hey. It's not in my, my Bible, but I believe you had to yell, hey! Because Gideon was not threshing wheat like, he, like, like you would normally do it. He's hiding down in a wine press, and I believe the angel looks over and says, hey, Gideon! You! You mighty man of valor! I don't say it, but I believe Gideon said it. What? Are you what? Who are you talking to? And he begins to say why he doesn't qualify. Come on, that's good. Begins to say why God shouldn't call him what he called him. How many ever been felt like that? You see, it doesn't matter what you've done or how you've done it or how qualified you think you are. God looks at you differently than you look at yourself. Right. And He certainly looks at you differently than other people might imagine. Yeah. You see, other people will look at you and say, no, they did this, they did that, they did this wrong, they did that wrong, and no way will God ever use them. But I come right back to the divine prerogative of God to call you something different. Put it up. You see, God doesn't call you what you are. He calls you what he's going to make you. Oh, yes. You know that's true. Yes, that's right. That's right. Now you have to be a part of that. You, you can't just be obstinate and stubborn. You can't can't just say, well, God, do it. I'm going to stand here like a, a stick and I'm, and I'm not going to participate. No, we have to participate. Yes. But God calls us. Thank God he calls us. Not what we are, but what he is going to make us. Yes. Now let me bring it home. What does God see in this building? He sees mighty women of God. Mighty men of God. Somebody look at your neighbor right now. Matter of fact, touch two or three people and say, You're a mighty woman or a mighty man of God. Mighty. Now don't mess up and call a woman a mighty man of God. She's a mighty woman of God. Aren't you thankful? That God sees us differently than we see ourselves. I had them sing that song because it talks about what God says. You say, I'm strong when I think I'm young. How many ever felt weak in your life? You say that I'm held, that I'm not a part, but God says that He owns me. That's not the words, but that's the depth of what that song is talking about. Aren't you glad for what God calls you? Yes. Now say it to yourself. I am, I am a mighty man, a, mighty man, a, woman, a woman of God.
God has called you to do to become something different. This morning, are you ready to be loosed by the power yeah. of the Lord? The power of the Holy Spirit. To be what God has called you to be. You see, Gideon said all the reasons why he could not be who the angel of God was talking about. You see, it doesn't matter if God calls you a mighty man or woman of God, then you're no longer bound to your heritage. You're no longer bound to your family. You're no longer bound to your possessions. And you're no longer bound to what people think of. That's right. That's Come on, right. that's good preaching. That's right. Amen. You see, I'm so glad that God doesn't call me to be what I currently am, but He calls me what He's going to be. Yes, amen. Hallelujah. And this morning, I see mighty men and women of valor in this house. We look at this situation, and it changes. Like that. I believe Gideon believed what God said. Something changed in Gideon. Mm -hmm. And instead of threshing wheat, he sends out a call. Hey! I, I need men and... I need... I'm going to say women. We know that the women didn't fight. I, I need some men and some women of God to show up and to help me. He didn't need help threshing wheat. He needed help fighting against the enemy. Yes, yes, yes. And 32,000 people show up. Right. Oh my goodness. As a pastor, I'd feel awesome if 32,000 people show up. <laughs> Somebody give me a big amen. amen. But God doesn't always work in big numbers. As a matter of fact, God usually gets more done with a small amount of people yeah, than He ever accomplishes with a great big yeah. number of people because He wants to get the glory. Yeah. 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 And all of a sudden, God says, you tell them if they're afraid, they can go on home. So here is a man who at one point was hiding, threshing wheat, when they should have been fighting. You see, when we deal in fear, it's, it's illogical. Because if the enemy won, they're going to take the wheat that he's threshed. Uh huh, that's right. You see, what God has blessed you with, what he allows you to hide, you're supposed to use for the kingdom. Yeah, that's exactly oh. right. Yeah. So 10,000 people are left. 22 thousand people are afraid. They're afraid. And God says, that's not good enough to me. Still too many. I believe Gideon probably said, what? Again. What, God? And so he takes them down to Herod's spring. And he begins to give Gideon some instruction. So here's a man who's threshing wheat and afraid. All of a sudden, something changes in him because I believe that he understood that uh, I am not what I think I am. I am what God told me. Yes, yes. And now he's choosing an army. A coward from a cowardly position and now choosing an army. It's powerful to believe what God calls you. Yes. And he takes them down to Herod's spring. And he begins to sort them out. And he takes them and this spring serves as a judgment of character. If the men get out and they drink like a dog, they lap it up and then they're unfit and they need to be let go. There's some people in your life you need to let go. Uh, Come on, you ought to say amen. Amen. Why do we hold on to people that are bad for us? Because even the bad stuff feels comfortable at, t at times. Come on. There's some people in your life you need to let go. Uh, they might not even be a bad person, but they're bad for you and you're bad for them. Come on. Right. 
So there's some people in your life that you need to let go. <laughs> and here are the men and the ones who face first. Get down and begin to lick like a dog and begin to lap up the water. God says, let them go. They're not fit. But the ones who've been down and scoop the water and they're looking around and they're observing. You see, you need to know where the enemy is. You need to see what the enemy's doing. You don't need to turn your back. You need to, to be constantly about your calling, which is to defend the honor of God. Come yeah. on. Yeah. And so, they're looking around. And they haven't laid down. You, you see, in order to get down and lap like a dog, you've got to take off all of your <clears throat> items of warfare. All of your ammunition. All of, I don't know what they have. And you've got to lay it down. But the ones who stood down you know, probably still had their, <coughs> their arrow, their spear, whatever. And they could keep it on. Bring water to them. What's the difference? The one who laughs like a dog is controlled by his fleshly appetite. Come on. Hear me. The ones who don't laugh like a dog, they're not controlled by that. They're controlled by the call. What it's called to do? To defend the nation. To defend God. See that with me again. There are people in your life that you need to let go. Those men laughing like a dog weren't real soldiers. They weren't real. Have you ever been around some people that just weren't real? Only 300 men. Imagine if you're getting 300 men out of 32,000 to start. Less than 10%. Hmm. And I tell you, not only there's some people you need to let go of, but be careful who you choose to go into battle with. Yeah. You, you need to make sure you understand who you're going into battle with. That's right. <coughs> do they have their back and do you have theirs? Yeah. Are you called of God or, or are you merely driven by your fleshly appetite? There, there are people that you need to let go of, but there are also people that you need to choose to help you in that. And if you're following God, God will instruct you about who to put, who to put next to you in the battle. How many have that person in mind right now? That person that you would you'd call if you got in trouble. That that person that, that you'd give a call to and say, pray for me. I, I'm just struggling right now. And, and this is going on and that is going on. That that's God gives you instruction. He gives you the ability to determine who you need to put next to you when you're going into battle. And it, it won't be a lot of people. It'll be the few that God uses. Now, look at this. God gives some very strange instructions. Let me just say this. When God gives instructions, number one, be obedient. Even if it sounds crazy. Right? Even if it sounds crazy. God gave some strange instructions and He says, you are to take a pitcher, and you are to take and put a candle inside of it, and in the other hand you are to have a trumpet. And when you see the enemy, don't attack. What would you have to attack with? Can you got that trumpet? Yes. Come up here. Imagine. You're surrounded by the enemy. And instead of using all the weapons that the other people had left, instead of using those and double arming yourself, God says, take a picture. A clay one. Somebody say clay. It's important. Take a clay picture. Put a light. Have a trumpet in the other hand. Come on. 
And when you get close to the enemy, don't attack. Somebody say, the battle is the Lord's. The battle is the Lord's. Don't attack, but simply break the pitcher. Let the light shine out and blow, go ahead, blow. And blow the trumpet as loud as you can. Let your praise come forth. 
Let your praise be lifted up. When you leave this place today, I'm declaring over you that you're mighty men and women of God. Mighty men and women of God. And that the enemy has no power over you when you blow your trumpet, when you sound the praise. See, God had already whispered into the hearts of some of the soldiers surrounding them a dream. God had already interpreted for them that they were going to be defeated. And they didn't know how. Praise will defeat them. Praise will over the light of God that shine forth from your clay pitcher will defeat the enemy. Now let me ask you a question. If that is true, then why have you allowed the enemy to take your shout and to take your trumpet? Come on. Can I, can I just get in your face a little bit? If, if, if you know that to be true, then why have you allowed the enemy to take your shout and to take your praise. Help me. Everybody say, I love Pastor Brian. I love Pastor Brian. If you believe this, why have you allowed the enemy to take your shout? You shout about everything else. You get all involved about everything else. You get all uproar about everything else. Why can't you shout to the Lord and give him a praise? around you because you have something of value in you. And you are something of that. that. Pardon the English, the enemy don't attack junk. That's right. Right? He wants what you have. You've got something inside of you that the enemy understands is important to the battle. And he wants to silence you before the battle even starts. Yes, yes, yes. Imagine if you're in that army of Gideon. I call it an army because it's 300 men with nothing but a pitcher, a light, and a trumpet. And Gideon sets them out there and they're surrounding on the other uh, side of the enemy. And he says, somebody blow the trumpet. We're going to blow it together. And then we're going to smash our pots and let the light come out. That takes faith, folks. It takes faith. Huh. In the natural, you'd say, I'm going to blow this. They're going to look up and say, who are those crazy people? Let's go kill them. But not in the spiritual realm. Because praise is powerful. Somebody says, praise, 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 praise is powerful. Is powerful. And I... Have something of value. The devil wants to silence me. The devil wants to stop me from praising. The devil wants to keep me from being victorious because I am valuable to the army of God. Look at your neighbor and say, Mighty man, mighty woman of God. Now, when I went to Israel, we took a side trip. I believe it was for me. As Dr. Valley said, I don't usually go here, but I feel led to go here. It was also for you, so you hear this message. And so we're sitting there looking at this cave where this stream comes out and the water flows. And I get a rock out of it. That's my keepsake. Mm. And it tells me that when I feel like I am nothing, that God chose me. Just like I chose this individual rock out of that creek, out of that stream. And God declares that I am 
and that you are a mighty man or woman of the heart. And as we stood there surrounding Herod Spring, the tour guide, who is a Messianic Jew, began to explain to us, did you know that the Israeli army this day uses this story as inspiration on how to fight the enemy. I mean, those Israel surrounded all the time. <laughs> on every side, yes. they are surrounded. Yes. When we were there, we were supposed to be able to go to see the troops at the border patrol, and they said, you can come, but only stay an hour because something is going on up north. It was an enemy. And that's where that began to explain that. They began to make a change in philosophy. That Israel used to, hear me, they used to have a passive defense kind of army. It's called Haganah in, the, in Hebrew. And so they would wait and they would stay in their homes and they would stay in their houses and they would stay in their cities and they would say, if the enemy comes, then we will defend our territory. Hmm. My, my, my. But the leader of the Israeli army took some inspiration huh. from the story of David. And instead of concentrating on thousands and thousands of soldiers and troops, he said, we're going to use a few little cell groups. And we're going to go out and we're going to spy on the enemy. And I tell you, I've already spied. The enemy is up to no good. Right. Yeah. That's right. He's here to steal, kill, and to destroy. That's the Bible said. But Jesus said, But I have come that you might have life. And that more abundant. And so now they go out and spy. Hear this. This is what I want you to hear this morning. They go out and spy, and they figure out what the enemy, the terrorists, are going to do. And they counterattack. Five minutes before the enemy can attack, they counterattack them. Hear this. This is inspired by God. If Gideon's trumpet is all about praise, and it is, and if it's all about shattering the clay pitcher, then there is a principle that we must understand is that we must be shock troops. That's what he called it. In Hebrew, it's called palmak. Palmak. Shock troops that go out and determine what the enemy is doing and attack before they get attacked. How many of you understand what I'm talking about? And so your praise is a shock to the enemy. Your praise serves as a shock to the enemy. Why? Because he don't understand why you should be praising when, were, when all the hell is breaking loose in your life. Come on, help me. He doesn't understand why you should be praising him whenever you feel sick and broken and downhearted. He doesn't understand that. And when you begin to praise God anyway, and you begin to praise him before you get the breakthrough, come on, help me, and you begin to praise him uh, before it all breaks loose, then God sends a disorienting light to the enemy and disperses. Yeah. Yeah. What's the principle? Praise first. It's God's battle. It's not yours. It's God's battle. Right. And I tell you that God will give you discernment. This came from my wife. She's good. God will give you discernment of what the enemy is up to. Yes. And then you just begin to praise God that He's going to give you a breakthrough and it ain't even going to happen. Hallelujah. How many of you ever got discernment that it felt like the enemy was just surrounding you, like a buzzard trying to, to come in for the attack? And God will give you discernment in those times. And that's for you to get your praise on with 
before the enemy can attack. Uh -huh. Come on. You know what I'm talking about. Teresa, would you come to the piano? Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 22. I want you to see this. It talks about Jehoshaphat. Let me remember the story. He sends the singers and the praisers. Not behind, but out front. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody say shock troops. <laughs> Uh, you, you see, you know, shot. Can you imagine the enemy's like, what is going on with them people? They must have a mighty army behind them because they're praising like they already have won. Yes, 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 you already have won. The battle is won. Just praise it. As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah. Somebody say Judah. Judah. You know what Judah stands for? Praise. Uh, the enemy was trying to invade their praise. Oh, you got to get this. You got to get this. I'm not going to let the enemy invade my praise. I'm going to praise God before, during, and after the battle because I know I am victorious in the blood of Jesus Christ and the word of my Savior. The enemy wants to attack your Judah. Huh. Oh, that ought to make you mad. That ought to make you mad enough to just stand up and praise the Lord anyway. How many won't be victorious before it even all starts? Yeah. 